Golden State Warriors are one win away from clinching their fourth title in seven years, which is a wildly impressive feat. But there is going to be plenty of time to talk about that. Uh, afterwards, I want to talk about Game 5. Because Game 5 was like three different games all in one. So the first half was very Warriors heavy. They came out with a type of energy and fire and communication. They were just hitting on all cylinders. And that's what fans have kind of been wanting to see this whole series. Like, they tend to be like a team that turns it on and turns it off. But here, that first half, they were engaged. They were hyper-focused. They were pressuring Boston nonstop. And it, it looked like it was going to be a huge Warriors blowout win. They go into halftime only up by 12, but all signs point to, hey, they're going to come out. They're going to get that third quarter avalanche yet again. And that'll be all she wrote on this one. But instead, after halftime, the Boston Celtics came out and just flipped it on the Warriors completely. Uh, they've been outscored in the third quarter alone, like 130 to 30 something. Like the Warriors third quarters in this finals have been historic. But here, tonight, Boston absolutely flipped it on them. They hit eight or nine straight threes uh, after missing all of their threes in the first half. And they looked like a, a completely different team. The way they were pressuring Golden State, the way they were just making it impossible for Steph Curry to get any rhythm going. I said after game four that I thought if Boston had any chance, what they were going to have to do is... They were going to have to shut down Curry, and they were going to have to make everyone else beat them. And in that third quarter, that's exactly what they did. And they used that to, to have a huge swing in the game. They ended up taking the lead momentarily. Then, when it looked like we were going to get a game in the fourth quarter, we were going to get a good, close, competitive game, a tale of two halves, instead became like a third separate game, and the Warriors just used a huge run in the fourth again, powered by defense, transition points, and everyone else stepping up. Uh, this was not a good Steph Curry game. He had 43 in game four, put the entire team, the franchise, everyone on his back, and said, I got you in game four tonight. He only goes for 16 points on 7 of 22 shooting. He also did not hit a 3, which is the first time in four years that he has not hit a 3. And it's the first time in his playoff career he's never hit a 3. So they were doing a very good job of pressuring him. And for a while it looked like it was going to work. But then, but then, the Boston Celtics... Forgot about Andrew Christian Wiggins, a.k.a. the Maple Jordan, who decided that today, tonight, Game 5 of the NBA Finals, he was going to bust out that moniker and be the absolute catalyst for this team to pull off this win and to put them at the, at the doorstep of another title. The Andrew Wiggins trade with the Timberwolves has been a lot of back and forth, um... Kind of felt like it was inevitable for both sides. The Timberwolves just weren't, it wasn't working. Uh, everyone, the, the book was written on Wiggins. It was, oh, you know, he has all this talent, but he's just, he just doesn't want to apply himself. He just doesn't have the drive. And he goes to the Warriors. Any team could have had him. He was basically just considered like, a not a bust because he's had some good years, but he was just like an overpaid, overdrafted, like, role-playing wing. And here in his first full season with the Warriors, he has absolutely rehabilitated and reshaped his image. He is an all-star starter now for the first time in his eight-year career. And he, is been, he has been the second-best player for the Warriors in these finals. Steph Curry has been on a historic pace, and he is in prime position to get his first finals MVP, which is an odd thing to judge Steph Curry's career on, but it really feels like a lot of people are waiting for him to get that finals MVP to be like, okay, now he's the greatest, uh, which doesn't really, I don't understand it, but Andrew Wiggins, if, if he does this again and they close out Boston, it's at least a debate. Um, he has been incredible. He had 16 rebounds in Game 4. Tonight, he goes for a playoff-high 26. 
He goes for 13 rebounds again, and he just played stifling defense, and he he rebounded like way past his size, and he was aggressive early on. He saw them trapping Curry, and he was, you know, attacking the rim. He was attacking the the spots where he can get that easy to that like easy to long to pull up. He he was like a completely different player, and it 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 showed the entire game. There were points where they were like, all right, well, now we got Curry in here with three non-shooters and Wiggins. So if they're sending the doubles at Curry, he's going to have to do... And like while Jeff Van Gundy is saying that, Wiggins is like getting the ball and driving to the rim and like attacking in the paint and throwing these crazy floaters off of the glass. And it was just, it was unbelievable. If you had said, you know... Before the series, before the playoffs, before the season, at any point, if you had said Andrew Wiggins is going to be the second best player on the NBA Finals team, like on an NBA Finals team that is one win away from the title, I don't know how many diehard basketball fans would agree with you or would believe you or any of that. Because the story about him, like I said, has been one of of underachievement. And his acceptance of this role in Golden State has been just flawless um, in terms of, you know, what they needed, what they were looking for, and what he was in prime position to give. Another thing that makes it even harder for Timberwolves fans to watch is the fact that the Timberwolves also happened to throw in a pick for the Warriors uh, that became Jonathan Kaminga, who is not playing much in this finals. He saw like a minute in garbage time tonight. But still, Wiggins looking like this, a literal all-star starter, and Kaminga just as a throw-in. And, you know, it's it's a bad look. I had a Celtics fan friend text me and say he was madder at the Timberwolves for making that trade than he was at Boston for losing these games. He was like, it's Minnesota's fault. It's not Boston's fault anymore. Um, I don't know about that. For Boston, it kind of seems like they're really running out of gas here, uh, which is hard to say after, after the flurry that they had in the third quarter. But... Jason Tatum, 10 of 20 tonight, 27 points, 5 of 9 from 3, 10 rebounds. He looked like he was going to have a monster night. And then I don't know if it was fatigue, defense, injury, combination of everything, but he just kind of started settling. He settled on a lot of his shots. Jalen Brown did not have a very good game. 5 of 18 tonight, 18 points. Um, I have a couple Celtics fan friends who have said that... uh, if they don't win this title, they're ready to call in Jalen Brown for Bradley Beal. Uh, the Jason Tatum Bradley Beal connection is strong. I have no idea. That's an entirely different video, but it's just you know a nice little glimpse into the psyche of, of Celtics fans right now, uh, with the series heading back to Boston on Thursday. Um, but other than that, I mean Marcus Smart had twenty points, seven of fifteen, but only had two assists. And I had said earlier in the series that I thought one of the keys was going to be Marcus Smart's ability as a playmaker to get those open shots for those role players and to kind of get them in rhythm. So like Al Horford, Peyton Pritchard, um, Derek White, those guys have just not looked the same in the back half of these games. I don't know if it's fatigue. I don't know if it's a confidence thing like in in the instance of Derek White, but they are just not shooting the same that they did in the Eastern Conference Finals and to start this Finals. So, I don't know what Boston can do. They're heading back into Boston. They will obviously come out with some energy because they're not coached to just roll over. But it kind of feels like they're they're running low. They only ran a seven-man rotation tonight after doing eight for the last couple games, which is tough as well. Uh, Derek White, 21 minutes. Grant Williams, 16 minutes. And Peyton Pritchard, five. And that was it for the bench until garbage time. Uh, That's a lot of wear and tear to put on your guys. Tatum, 44 minutes. Robert Williams, 30. Marcus Smart, 40. Jalen Brown, 44. Like, it's getting to be the point where it's like the Warriors are just going to be able to survive those bench minutes better than Boston can. And if Boston's not going to the bench and not getting those contributions and their stars are playing those minutes... It's going to be hard for them to to keep up that intensity and that effort for an entire 48-minute game. Um, And tonight, the Warriors only, you know, they stuck with their their eight-man, nine-man rotation. Uh, Kevon Looney came into foul trouble pretty quick. He had two quick fouls in the first half. 
So Steve Kerr put out um, Andre Iguodala for a stretch, only about four minutes. Nemanja Bialica saw the court for about five minutes. And other than that, it was just the starters, Jordan Poole, and uh, probably the, the sneaky player of the game, Gary Payton II, who continues to just build this reputation as like a, a fan favorite type who will do everything that the star players don't want to. He'll get in there and scrap for loose balls. He'll fight for those boards. He'll fight for those putbacks. He'll get in and try to take the charges. He'll get like, he's just doing all of the things you need a role player to do on a championship run. And having him back has been a huge, huge boost to this team because they've been able to match up a little bit more individually on Tatum and Brown because Clay Thompson defensively has been absolutely incredible these last couple games on Jalen Brown. He's staying with him almost one-on-one. He's being able to alter those shots, force Jalen into those tough shots, make him pick it up and, you know, toss back out to another teammate. He has been unbelievable in being able to, you know, stay with him and to hang with him after looking, you know, like he had lost his step, which is, you know, understandable given he had two catastrophic leg injuries in you know, a two-year span and missed about 900 days of basketball. Like, it's to be expected that there'd be some fatigue, but he seems to be shaking that off at the perfect time. He is not shaking off his shooting woes. He did have a better game tonight. 7 of 14 from the field, 5 of 11 from 3, 21 points, and a game 6 on the horizon. So, game 6 Clay might go into Boston and make everyone forget all about these struggles and help this team bring a title home. But if you're Boston, you're, you've are you got to be ready to empty the tank because the Warriors won this game. They probably shouldn't have won this game with how poorly Steph Curry shot, but truly everyone on the Warriors picked up and contributed when they needed to. Andrew Wiggins led the way. He is the big takeaway from this game, of course. Draymond Green also set the mood early. He was aggressive with his shot early on. He only finished with eight points. He did have eight rebounds, six assists. So it did, you know, seem like he was a little bit more aggressive than he had been. Um, And that intensity kind of just carried over the entire game. And that's something that kind of has seemed to ebb and flow as, as he's gone in this series. Like, if he's not, you know, hitting shots or if he's getting blown by on defense assignments or missing something, like, he's just, you know, kind of psyching himself out. So to see him fully engaged tonight to be that tone setter for the team, it was pretty clear early on that, like, he was like, no, we're we're winning this. It's not, it's not happening. We're not losing this one at home. Um, and the other big story, I, I know free throws are a popular... Um, popular point of contention but tonight Boston shot 31 free throws to the Warriors 16 um and the Warriors had 28 fouls called on them to Boston's like 15 I want to say 16 so this was something I actually I saw a post let me see because I saved it it was uh it was on basketball forever on Instagram uh really good follow if you don't already follow them Uh, And this is what it said. So Jason Tatum had his best shooting game of the series and was the highest scorer for either team in the game. The Celtics out-rebounded the Warriors 47-39. Boston had twice as many free throws as Golden State. The Warriors were 9 for 40 from 3. That is 22.5%. Steph Curry did not hit a 3 for the first time in 4 years. Marcus Smart averaged, or he scored 20 points, which is double his season average. And despite all of that, the Celtics still lost by 10 points. So not what you want to hear if you're a Celtics fan, uh, especially because this was the game. This was the game to steal that home court advantage back, go into Boston for game six up 3-2, and close it out at home in front of your fans. And now instead... Golden State can hopefully come out and play loose while Boston is going to have that back up to the back up against the wall. We need to throw everything out, leave everything out here. Um, Oh, the other thing I was going to say before I get out of here, the other big thing has been ball security. The Warriors have been a historically notoriously loose team when it comes to turnovers and they're just talented enough that it, you know, it doesn't always come back to bite them. But here tonight they had six turnovers That's like a third of what they've been averaging throughout this series. And Boston had 18. 
So that's sloppiness. Uh, Jason Tatum alone, I believe, has set the record for most turnovers in a finals. He's got like 95, 96 turnovers in five games. I don't know what's going on with him. I don't know if it's fatigue, if it's injury, if he's, you know, if he's more hurt than maybe he's letting on, just playing through it. I'll be really curious to see because he has these spells where he looks like the best player on the court. And he has these instances where you're like, well, you look like this is your rookie year again. And like, what are you doing? So I'll be really curious to see what happens with this game six. Um, I still kind of think it's going to end up going seven. But I think given the fact that, you know, Boston had this kind of silver platter of an opportunity here, um, I don't know. It kind of feels like the Warriors have them where they want them. And now it's going to just be a matter of Golden State actually, like, committing <laughs> to sealing the deal. Um, you know, they've been in this position before and they'll come out and, you know, maybe they take a bunch of bad threes early, fall into a bit of a hole, turn the ball over six times in the first quarter or something, and then... There you go. Boston's off to the races and we got a game seven. So I'm really curious to see if the Warriors can come out with this same intensity. I would think having been there before, it should be a no brainer. But with how this series has gone, uh, nothing like, again, I say it all the time and nothing would surprise me. Uh, so that's that's it. Let me know your thoughts on this game on um, the rest of the series. If you see this going seven or if you think this was kind of the Celtics best shot and that's it please let me know in the comments. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for watching. All respect to our King Maple Jordan. I will see you soon.